second to the post-coronavirus uh, uh, skeleton keys to contemporary sociological theory. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about another Frenchman, uh, Jean Baudrillard, uh, uh, and we're going to be reading and, and um, talking about the first chapter of Zimulacra and Zimulation uh, from 1981. I have, uh, as all French social theorists, I'm, I, I have my black turtleneck as worn. Um, I have my uh, cigarette and, and the proper sort of existential attitude. Um, uh, c'est la vie. Anyway, um, so we're going to walk through um, mostly chapter one, uh, which really contains sort of the core of the argument. Many of the, re the other essays are sort of um, side developments or extensions of arguments that are already embedded in the first chapter. So in some ways, Baudrillard provides us with a skeleton key uh, himself in, in uh, again, by kind of packaging everything in kind of a uh, condensed way in the first chapter. Much like de Bord, uh, Baudrillard's uh, book is odd. It's uh, it it um, it doesn't follow the conventions of of uh, sort of academic uh, professional uh, social theory. It's it's again kind of aphoristic, um, um, impressionistic. Um, many of the arguments are are incomplete. I think it'd be the right way to put it. Um, they're not well documented. Some of the examples that are used are 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 um, like, for example, he writes about about Walt Disney being uh, frozen, right? Had, who ha apparently had himself frozen after death, which is a myth that's that's completely, as far as I can tell, completely uh, uh, devoid of any empirical reference. So, so you know, he's using these sort of odd examples that are themselves somewhere in between false and completely simulated, and and maybe that's the point he's trying to make here is is that um, is that it's difficult to tell what's false and what's just simply a simulation where we can no longer know any anymore what's true or false so at any rate it's an odd book um, not my favorite text by any means uh, but it's very important and very influential so uh, we're going to spend some time with it today and and if we're ever at a moment when when uh the question of the simulacra or simulation seems important. Uh, the era of Trump uh, might be it. So, so you know, is trying to comprehend and make sense of of um, again our political moment and the possibilities of politics in the 21st century. Sort of, at some point, we have to confront um, uh, Baudrillard's uh, you know postmodern uh, uh, theory. Okay, so uh, the image here is a reference to the unbelievably good 1999 film, uh, The Matrix. Um, it shouldn't be as good as it is, but uh, so much of, of uh, Baudrillard's um, book is, is visible in, in The Matrix trilogy. And uh, The Desert of the Real, uh, which is uh, what we're seeing depicted here on screen, is an actual quote. Um, you know, from the first page of the book, right? Uh, the Desert of the Real. So we'll be walking through what that means. Okay. All right. So again, back to uh, um, my uh, my uh, anti PowerPoint here. Okay. So um, all right. So the the first chapter is the precession of Zimulacra. So it's it's an odd argument. It's an odd term, precession. And it really means proceed. So the argument that he's making is that we're in a, a kind of cultural era. Um, I would like to place something like Marxist analysis of capitalism in, in the foreground. Baudrillard doesn't, but it seems to me that what he's arguing is is that like like De Board, we've reached a point in the accumulation of capital where uh, images have become so dominant. And uh, that, and the uh, truth status of images has become very, very difficult to determine. And so the simulacra is. Uh, so the argument here is that uh, is that in most of the history of representation in the West, the original has preceded the copy. You have the model who's then painted in the painting follows the, uh, you know, is, is a representation of something that's original. And now we're in a moment, he argues, where the, the image, the representation, the copy precedes the original. 
and actually is disconnected from uh, the original. And, you know, in, 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 as we get to the end of the chapter, the argument is going to be that, that in our time, um, models that are generated um, purely in the symbolic realm, um, so imagery that isn't sort of um, capturing re the real, but is instead sort of depicting or illustrating the symbolic, um, has become a generator of hyper reality. So we'll talk more about that. But the idea is that we're, we're, we're sort of becoming disconnected from nature, disconnected from or organic life, disconnected from uh, an obdurate kind of material reality and um, and are instead living in, a, in, in, in cultural forms that are uh, derived from symbolic models. OK, so, you know, as we're, we're getting get into this, uh, probably the best way to think about this is is, of course, the world of video games or the entire sort of um, atmosphere generated by social media where the real world gets left behind one status in the real world doesn't even matter one's capacity to score high in a in a, in a game or to um uh, represent oneself in an attractive way or in a kind of envy inducing way in social media sort of overrides um the real life one leads so um so, so again, the way that we're seen has little to do with how we really are. But in, so, so in other words, people are trying to represent their real life. The images that they're posting online aren't representations of their real life. Instead, they're, they're images that are derived from already existing culturally accepted symbolic forms. So you follow the lead of someone like the Kardashians and you try to represent yourself as, as one of them or you, you know, again, you're, the, the images that you're depicting aren't built up or derived from, induced from real life, but are instead sort of um, uh, generated from symbolic models, okay? So the model or the symbolic form precedes the image and leaves reality behind altogether, right? So that world, artificial reality, um, you know, synthetic space, that kind of thing. Okay, all right. So the book opens with this bizarre fable of, of, uh, of, Bor of Borges, um, the, um, the fable of the one-to-one -one map, right? So, um, so here's how this works, right? It opens with this strange fable of the one-to-one -one map. The, a map of a cartographer uh, tried to make a map so detailed, so perfect, such a perfect representation of reality that it wound up covering the entire territory one-to-one. -one, right? And of course, such a map would be ridiculous, uh, but, uh, but, but that's the claim that there was a territory, an imperial uh, a territory that had a map overlaid upon it one-to-one. -one. The beautiful allegory of simulation, right? A perfect double of the actual world. So, um, so again, this is sort of the, the basic idea of Western representation. You have the real and, and the ideal that we're aiming at in the imaginary or in the copy is to get as close as we can uh, to the real. So the, per the perfect mirror, right, with the great silvered back that shines a perfect image uh, uh, back to the person that's not distorted in any way, but it's, it's perfect. That would be the one-to-one -one map, right? The one-to-one -one map. Nothing is left out. No detail is is eliminated, and so on. Okay, so so that's the claim. So it's a perfect doubling. The territory precedes the map, and here in in Borges' fable, you get a map that's so perfect that it completely uh, you know captures this. My daughters loved a Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, there was a moment in Buffy the Vampire Slayer where Buffy's apparently dead and where her uh, um, stalker, we'll call him, uh, Spike, generates the Buffy bot, right? And the Buffy bot was uh, an almost perfect double of, of Buffy, right? Functioned as Buffy. The vampires that, that were to be slayed were still as afraid of the Buffy bot as they would have been of the real Buffy because the, the, the model is so perfect. Okay, so here's the idea that, that, that you're trying to represent reality with such fidelity, such that, 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 um, that it becomes a kind of uh, a perfect uh, mirror image. Okay, so that was the West, the double. We'll leave some of the rest of this out. All right, now in, in um, the fable ends with um, 
his claim that that um, that that as if you actually get a copy that completely covers the reel, it decays back into the reel. That the reel and the in the copy collapse into each other, right? So if you did have a Buffy bot that was completely um, indistinguishable from Buffy, um, the difference between the Buffy bot and Buffy would, would, would collapse into each other. If you had the capacity to generate something like a, you know, a, a non-organic body with, with, uh, and then install something like a software program that, that generated the personality and so on of, of the person, the difference between the person and the bot would collapse into each other, right? They'd be substitutable for each other. In this instance, the map, according to, to Baudrillard, right, um, overlays the territory and crumbles back into the territory. So the idea is that the map, because it gets rained on, gets soggy and so on, it becomes dirt, becomes soil, it becomes part of the territory itself. The map, the copy returns back to the real, except in the desert, right? In the desert, the few places where there's the desert uh, of representation, that, that where the desert is, the rain doesn't fall, and the representation, the map, stays intact. And it's remnants of fragments, right? So where the desert is, the distinction between the real and the copy can still be discerned, whereas in the rest, where the rain is falling, the copy has fallen into the real. So this becomes important. Because he argues at the bottom of page one that today the simulation is not a copy of the real, right? The map isn't a copy of the real, but instead is, is a generation by models of a real without origin. So we have a symbolic order, a model that we then use to generate images without having a real underneath it, okay? So this is what something that we're, we're going to call hyperreal, uh, or what he would call the simulacrum, or the or or um, or the world of simulacra in, in in plural. Okay. So the concept of the uh, of the um, of the desert of the real then is uh, here. It is the real and not the map now whose vestiges persist here and there in the deserts that are no longer those of the empire, but are the desert of the real itself. So, so his argument would be that as the model goes first, right, um, that there are going to be places, the desert, that, that, that it is going to be in the places of the desert in the map that you're going to be able to discern that, that there is no real underneath because the difference between them is going to still be, um, be, be visible. So that would be my argument or at least one interpretation at this point. Moment. Okay. So, uh, so what we generate then is it's something like an open world. Okay. Um, a virtual reality video game, open world game. My, uh, my daughters play Minecraft, I uh, have for years. Um, it, 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 it's an open world game where the possibilities are never exhausted, right? The game generates, um, it, it continues to extend at the margins, uh, in perpetuity. Um, and then my, my, one of my daughters loves to play this game called No Man's Sky. I've seen it. It's, again, a kind of an open world game of exploration. And it's a computer model, a simulation uh, that generates infinite uh, permutations of planets and of animals and of plants and so on. And apparently players of this game in the last, what, two years have already discovered more species inside of the game that actually exist in um, in 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 you know the known the known universe so so it's a world again it's generated by a model by by a, a computer program it's not a representation of anything real but it's a model that then generates an imaginary a set of images that come across on a computer screen or on a television screen and and players then have an avatar representation of themselves inside of the game uh, that they manipulate and play so you're not basing the imaginary upon a real, but is instead it's a model, a symbolic model that generates a kind of, um, uh, you know, a skin of 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 um, of image that that is taken as real uh, by the players, even though it's not it's not real. So it's the precession of the simulacra, the precession of the symbolic order. Uh, that generates the imaginary instead of the precession of the real that precedes and, and generates the ima imaginary, okay? So as he says, the territory does not precede the map. Instead, now the map precedes the territory, like in the game No Man's Sky or in uh, Minecraft, okay? Uh, the precession of the simulacra that comes first, it precedes the real, right? 
So the image is preceded by the symbolic order that codes it, and uh, the real as such comes dragging behind uh, if it comes in at all. So the model then engenders, literally gives birth to, generates, um, creates uh, the territory, the hyper-real, as he calls it, okay? So there's Bordas' fa fable. The desert of the map of the empire shreds um, and, the, and eventually rots and becomes soil, collapses into the real, and it's only in the desert of the map where you can continue to discern the difference. Um, a map so complete that it becomes confused with the real and collapses back into it. In our era of simulacra, instead of the real preceding the map, we have the map that precedes the real of the territory. So the territory um, shreds and rots across the extent of the map uh, and remains only in the desert of the map, which is the desert of the real itself, right? It's only there that the difference can be discerned. Okay which is uh, that image, uh, again, from the Matrix, uh, where Neo and um, are, are living in, the, are experiencing this small little space, the desert of the real, where the difference between the real and the um, simulation become visible, are still discernible. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So the dream of the, so cartography then, if, pursued all the way, the Western project of cartography, of map making, it would end with an ideal correspondence to the map and the territory, one-to-one, -one, perfect fidelity of reproduction. Um, but at that point, he argues, metaphysics would end with the loss of the difference between being and appearance, the real and the mirror image, that kind of stuff, it would all go away, which means that that if you actually had perfectly uh, uh Reproduction with perfect fidelity, the differences would disappear and the real and appearance would fall into each other and collapse. And it is that which he argues has happened in our time. Okay. So that's the era of simulation. No more metaphysical distinctions between the real and the imaginary, the real and the appearance, the original and the copy. They collapse back into each other and they become indiscernible from each other. Okay. So in the era of the simulacra, uh, he writes about you know miniaturization, um, which I think is really the symbolic coding of DNA and the symbolic coding of of, um, of something like digital uh, uh, software and digital um, um, uh, programming. Um, so the real becomes produced by miniaturized cells, matrices, memories uh, reproduced in an infinite number of times. From these, no longer really the real. Instead, it's the hyper-real produced in hyperspace without atmosphere. So it's just like this particular video that you're watching now can be reproduced an infinite number of times. It's digitized. It's actually just a bunch of codes inside of something like, you know, the mothership wherever YouTube is located, right? And you're downloading it and can watch it an infinite number of times by an infinite number of people. It's infinitely reproducible without any loss of fidelity. Right. That this is different from uh, from copies that were made of, say, Renaissance paintings, where each time the copy is reproduced, errors are entered or distortions are entered. So if you had a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, it would become quite distorted from the original. If you've ever done old photocopying, you all are too young to do this anymore. But but if you have a photocopy of a book and then you borrow someone's photocopy. I used to do this, we called it the proletarian press when I was in graduate school. Instead of buying a book, we'd photocopy the dang thing, and then we'd borrow somebody's photocopy to make another photocopy, and then another photocopy from that, another photocopy. And by the time you get down to the fifth or sixth uh, uh, layering copy of a copy, the thing is almost unreadable, right? There's so much noise has been entered into it by the distortions of the copying machine itself. Okay, so, so, we don't have that anymore with digital reproduction um, and even with like DNA coding, right? Genetic coding that we use to say produce plant hybrids from a model, right? You can reproduce the bloody thing in perpetuity without any loss of fidelity. So that's the era of the simulacra or of simulation. It's the capacity to reproduce from symbolic coding an infinite number of imaginaries that the real and the uh, imaginaries sort of collapse into each other. I love the idea of the Pong video game, which would have existed at the time, I think, that that, um, that that Baudrillard was writing. If you've ever seen Pong, 
it's not there's no imaginary to it almost right i mean it's sort of like a tennis game or something or or a pickleball but it's extremely stripped of imaginary uh content it's just like a little blip that moves across the screen and something like a little bar that represents a paddle that moves back and forth very very devoid of imagine of 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 imagery and illustration and beauty or anything it's just a symbolic coding and the player it simply plays as a, a, a symbolic code. You know, Tetris is a little bit like that if you've ever played that. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, on page two, downloaded images, music, videos, uh, video programs, the cookies that are embedded in your uh, machine as you're surf, uh, you know, surfing the web or whatever it's called these days. Um, all of these things can be reproduced in infinity with in extreme detail, DNA sequencing, genetic modification, you know, the film Jurassic Park, that we have the capacity to generate a model, and then once the model is there, we can fool with the model and, and actually reproduce something that hasn't uh, existed um, uh, before and without a kind of referent in the real, okay? So again, we lose what he calls, I love the term, the sovereign difference between the real and simulation the sovereign difference disappears. So it's like these are different realms, different kingdoms of the real versus the imaginary, and that sovereign difference is, is eliminated um, with digital reproduction and, and genetics and so on. Okay. All right. So I'm going to skip here. So let's, let's very quickly... Um, God, I want to do this. Yeah, let's... Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so just to sort of... Um, give this a kind of framing that we're going to keep coming back to as the semester unfolds. Let's reference Baudrillard in relationship to a, a better French social theorist of the mid to late 20th century, Jacques Lacan. Um, and, and let's take a quick look at Lacan's triune model of the psyche or his uh, psychic model of the generation of reality, right? That has three sort of sort of realms of being. So in other words, this idea that there's a sovereign difference between these different realms is something that would be um, um, endorsed by Lacan. He would have gotten it in many ways from Lacan. So that there is, um, um, that there's the, the real, which is a distinct realm of being from the imaginary, which is a distinct realm of being from the symbolic. So we have three realms that are, um, that sort of coexist within a subject, within a person's psyche, but that these three realms are distinct from each other and that different types of psychic structures are oriented to the real and to the real to the imaginary and to the symbolic in a different way. So let's just really quickly walk this out. So every infant is born into the real, right? So we begin life as a real being, right? We're an organic, um, um, we have organs, um, you know, contained within a, a skin sack supported by a skeleton and so on. And we have a psyche, but the psyche is very, very rudimentary. And so our early life, you know, the early life of an infant, you're basically attached uh, to a mother-er uh, who, who provides for all of your organic needs. So the subject as born, the infant that's born, is a real subject of organic drives, right? Hunger, thirst, um, comfort, um, uh, f you know, food and drink and comfort, these kinds of things is all that one wants. And it really isn't until like, what, the third or fourth month of life that you really begin to uh, become aware of other people, those kinds of things. So slowly, as one is a real being living out uh, in existence, driven by organs and the satisfaction of organs, that you're impelled out into a mother er's care. And the mother er doesn't just feed you milk and and comfort and touch, but the mother er also feeds words, right? And so, and feeds reactions. And in other words, the mother serves as a mirror for the infant's identity. So Lacan's first great work, The Mirror Stage, argues that it is in this kind of initially organic relationship of infant and mother that one actually uh, uh, begins to develop an imaginary, an image, a literal image, an imaginary sense of self. That the mother isn't just a provider of physical, real things, but also provides 
um, a mirror image of the self. Am I good? Am I ha you know? Am I loved? Am I wanted? Am I bad? Am I not wanted? Those kinds of things um, come from the mother, right? And so the mother doesn't just stroke in comfort into the body of the child and a sense of body boundary, but the mother strokes and loves a sense of self. We'll just put it that way. Okay. So it is this interaction of bodies between mother and child leads to the interaction uh, at the imaginary level that generates the sense of self. So this is, so that's the real, so in other words, it's in those early months of life that we cease to be a mere real being and we become imaginary, right? That we develop a sense of ourselves and other. The mother-er takes on a kind of object reality in our mind. Uh, when the mother's not there, we have something like object permanence where we can imagine the mother coming back, those kinds of things. So we get a sense of our own self and our own identity. Okay, so the, so the, so the subject in the biological need for organic satisfaction leads to the relationship with the mother er and the relationship with the mother er generates um which is a uh, i think is how uh, which is means other in french so it's a small a that's the mother is small a and then you get small a prime other prime which is um Lacan's marker for the ego or the self or the eek the uh, uh the german a word for ego uh the anima and so, uh, and, and so that's our sense of self, our ego, right? The sense of self that we have. And we know that we as human beings begin very early in life to, to not just orient ourselves to our organic satisfaction, but instead towards, towards being um, uh, wanted by, loved by, accepted by um, the, our imagination of the other, which means that we become um, in, uh, an an imaginary psychological uh, ego, right? Okay, so at this point is an imaginary subject. We are the subject of A's desire. We imagine what the mother wants of us or the mother-er wants of us, and then we orient ourselves to that. So this is an entirely imaginary process, right? The mirror stage. So the reflective surface of the mother-er's care provides us with a sense of self, and then we begin to orient ourselves to that. Okay, so this is the imaginary. So in Lacan's... Uh, model of the psyche, every human being becomes an imaginary self as a mere reflection off of the provider of the real organic needs of, of the self. So the real precedes the imaginary, and this is key to understanding the significance of Baudrillard. From the first time that we as human beings crawled out of the primordial ooze, stood on our hind legs and said, give me Doritos or whatever we said the first time, um, we, we have developed an imaginary rooted on biological reality, right? And so it is our organic real needs, our organic drives and so on that ground us in a world of image, okay? Now, imagination we know has a certain um, uh, sovereignty to it. It's autonomous to a degree. Uh, for example, all of us dream at night. We go to sleep. Children do this, and our self runs around uh, with other selves at night. So it's somewhat autonomous from us. But, but by and large, the real precedes the imaginary. Okay. All right. And then the, we'll just really fast in the third stage. After we get to there, at about the age of say four, five, six, seven, depending upon uh, the exact uh, uh, culture that you're in, um, you stop being uh, only subject to the mother's imagination of you, but you become embedded within something like the symbolic order of society itself. So this usually takes place at the moment that um, that Lacan called symbolic castration, the moment when uh, when the child is removed from the ongoing pleasures of the mother-er and installed somewhere like in school or in a job or an apprenticeship or something like that, where one becomes subject to a big other outside of, uh, of the self. 
And so and at that point, you have to give up the mother's desire. So you're no longer the subject of, of the mother's desire. You now become the subject of the big other's desire. And the big other doesn't desire and love you in the same way. They want you to perform uh, um, a kind of function um, in accordance with law and language. We won't go into that too detailed. But but it becomes subject of a system, a structural system of symbolic coding of language and law, of language and law. So, to Lacan, again, from the first time we ever crawled out of the ooze and formed a society, the real preceded the imaginary, and the imaginary precedes the symbolic, right? So, you go, so this is the L model. So, if you can think of a big L here. Um, so, you begin with the, with the real, you go to the imaginary, and then the symbolic, okay? And that the fully developed subject is, is subject to the real organs, the imagination of the mother, uh, er, uh, and then and then the symbolic order as well of conscience and, and duty and those kinds of things. Lacan tells us that in the era of simulation, this entire structure gets reversed, and it gets reversed on the hinge of the imaginary. Okay, so children are born and raised with something like uh, the real, yet you've got to have your real needs met, and 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 then. And, but then instead of, of having a symbolic order that is rooted in and, um, and dialectically built upon the imaginary, which itself is dialectically built upon the real, we get the procession of the simulacra, which means you get the procession of the symbolic coding and the symbolic orders, which generates models, imaginary models, and so that the imaginary realm, the, the, the realm of ideas, excuse me, of images, of, of copies, of representation, um, uh, and so on, are derived from the symbolic. They're not built up from the real. So you get a kind of inversion of the whole thing. So, so the real gets, in, in our time, left off, left behind. And we're living in a kind of a world now that is a... Um, that is derived from symbolic coding that generates the appearance of reality that we no longer really have the capacity to verify is true or false in a real way uh, because it is again it, it's it's derived from uh, from a code so so how do we know if if um, if we're really doing well or not within a video game other than by the rules of the video game itself we can't really reference something like external standards of morality or anything like that, right? They're irrelevant. It's only the standards that are uh, symbolically coded into the game uh, that matter. So instead of the real leading to the imaginary, leading to the symbolic coding system of a society, we now have the symbolic coding system that generates the illusions or the imagery, the simulations of the real, right, without reference to it. So this is a massive inversion of the sort of ontology of being of um, of, of of human subjects uh, again from the first time we had a society until last week. So this is a really big change. So again, a kind of skeleton key to the book is provided right here. The argument is that we have reversed the um, th that imagery in the imaginary realm. Of, of, of representation, of simulation, of copies and models and signs is the hinge, right, upon which the traditional and modern world can be differentiated from the postmodern. The traditional world is one where the real and the imaginary lead up to the symbolic. The modern world is one where the real and the imaginary lead up to the symbolic. The imaginary is something that's based on the real. The symbolic is something that's sort of separated from the real, standards of judgment and so on come about there. And now we've seen a reversion of that. The real gets left behind. And so we're living in a world now where uh, reality as such, or what we're taking as really the simulacra, is something that is generating and flowing back and forth at this realm without reference back to the real of organic drives. Okay? So the symbolic order generates something like, you know, video game structures or open world uh, structures. And we live within that illusion and without reference, uh, again, down to the real. I think I'm going to pause it or end the video here, and then we'll start it up again uh, for, part, uh, for part two of this. Okay, so come back very shortly for part two of, uh, of 
the skeleton key to Baudrillard.